This is Kevin Blyer. He's the Emmy Award winning writer for The Daily Show. Along with writing for the show, he's contributed to several of Obama's speeches and co authored Earth. The book, most recently, he's written the book he's here to discuss tonight Be the People, Why This Man's Selfless Quest to Rewrite the Constitution of the United States. And tonight, he will be in conversation with the English comedian and Daily Show correspondent John Oliver, who is still taping at this moment. So, Kevin will read from the book and talk, and then John will appear, and they will have a conversation, and then Kevin will sign his book. So please um, join me in welcoming Kevin Blair. No, it's not. That is far too appropriate, really. Uh, yes, you heard the good news. The good news is that for certain, at 11 p.m. tomorrow tonight, or anytime tomorrow online, you will be able to enjoy a very funny segment with John Oliver on The Daily Show. How do I know this? Because right now he's taping a very funny segment on The Daily Show uh, that he and I actually wrote. So in part, I'm to blame, so forgive me for that. Um, we ended up taping a little late. I think they're taping it right now. We taped late because, as you might have noticed, we have been uh, we have been on hiatus for two weeks, so we're a little bit rusty, I suppose. That's probably the best excuse. So with any luck, he'll be joining us in progress, or as he might say, to progress. Really, I don't know if you would want a Brit to interview me about the American Constitution anyway, so I don't know if that's really the solution. Um, I would also say, and you probably see this coming, that if any of you uh, feel bad, or any of you friendly faces out there are a little bit less friendly, because yes, you had to either buy a book or buy a $10 gift card get, just to see my mug talk about my book, I understand, and I would really encourage you not to think of it as a $10 uh, service charge or a $10 penalty. But really, think of it as a tax, because I think we all know that in this day and age, that's appropriate. If it's good enough for the Supreme Court, certainly it's good enough for me. And frankly, it makes me feel less guilty, which is what I really wanted in this evening. Um, so of course, thank you to Jessica Strand and to everyone here at the Strand for having me. Um, you might also be amused by this. As I was checking my emails to um, before I well, started the tour, actually, but then again, she's been emailing a couple times. I got this email from Doris Kearns Goodwin, which I realized in, an, in a literate audience like this is egregious name dropping, so forgive me for that. Oh, Doris Prince Goodwin's emailing you, impressive. But what she said is, uh, I'll be there in spirit, along with, uh, along with James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. So I'm just thinking to myself, if any of you are sitting next to the spirits of James Madison or Alexander Hamilton, <laughs> let me know. Um, I also love that her email ends with eight punctuation marks. I'm not kidding. So I just, it amuses me that Doris Kearns Goodwin of all people would add eight punctuation marks to the end of her email, because that's not exactly a tactic she uses in many of her Pulitzer Prize winning uh, histories. Uh, you know, they were a team of rivals! You don't see that. I think that's an opportunity you missed. Uh, my name is Kevin Blyer, uh, and what you've heard is true. I have rewritten the Constitution all by myself, uh, with really no help from any of you people. I really could have used it. It's rather exhausting. Um, but I did. I fixed it. I corrected it. I eliminated all the errors that James Madison, in his shortness and short-sightedness, left behind. Um, now, of course, when I tell people that I rewrote the Constitution and things, um, instead of saying, well, good for you, they say, and understandably, well, why? Why did you do that? Um, and that is a fair question. It is a fair question for which I have a dozen very good answers and some terrible ones, I admit that. They're all in the book. Um, but I'm happy to uh, provide a few of them now. Uh, it would probably be too convenient, if not altogether incorrect, to say, well, I saw everyone else rewriting the Constitution, so why not me, my turn? Um, that seems to be a palatable answer for a lot of people. Um, I could also say, quite frankly, as I started to research this book, or as I call it, me search this book, I'll wait for it. Yeah, nice, right? <laughs> front row likes it. That's all I care about. I can't even see past the front row. Really. Um, I learned a few things about the Constitution that kind of shocked me. Um, and I also thought, if I rewrote this Constitution, which I presume to be a pretty bold stroke, uh, I'm not sure that anyone would actually notice. Because what I have learned is that most Americans, and I'm going to guess some people even in this room, don't really actually know what's in the Constitution. Um, the truth of the matter is that more American teenagers can name the Three Stooges than can name the three branches of government, which is shocking because it's the Three Stooges more than anything. It's not Bieber. I mean, we're talking 2008, a study in 2008, nonetheless. Um, we also know that most adults 
believe that uh, of the people, by the people, for the people, is, uh, is of course in the Constitution, even though as we might remember, it is of the Gettysburg Address by Abraham Lincoln and for crying out loud, perhaps someone <laughs> taught them that by now. Um, but at least that sounds like it could be in the Constitution, right? We can admit that. Um, I think most egregious is that a majority of Americans uh, think that from each according to his ability to each according to his needs <laughs> was written by James Madison, not Karl Marx. And by the way, for all your teenagers out there, Karl Marx was not one of the three stooges. <laughs> nor was he a Marx brother, I suppose. Uh, not very funny. Um, and so, actually, when John Boehner himself, in 2009, held up a copy of his pocket constitution at a rally in Ohio, his constitution, and said, all we want is a country that reveres the Constitution. And therefore, I stand here with the framers who wrote in the preamble to the Constitution, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, and uh, unfortunately did not realize that that's actually the second sentence of the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> I realize there's an opportunity here. Now, I say all of those things begrudging no one, belittling no one, denigrating no one, because quite frankly, we all have blind spots. One in four Americans ever remember having ever read the Constitution. And my blind spots, I swear, were just as big as anybody else's. Um, no doubt if you had asked me how the Constitution begins, I probably would have told you uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. <laughs> and then I started this project. And actually, that's not entirely untrue. It kind of was the best of times, it was the worst of times. So it could have been. Um, so that's one reason why I re rewrote the Constitution, because I felt I might do a service to remind people what's in it. But an even better answer that I hold to is that uh, I had no choice but to rewrite the Constitution. Because no less than Thomas Jefferson told me that I had to rewrite the Constitution. I figure Doris Prince Goodwin can talk to the spirits of James Madison and I can talk to the spirits of Thomas Jefferson. But it's Thomas Jefferson who said, and I believe we can all agree that Thomas Jefferson was more to the more foundry of the founding fathers, he said that every Constitution naturally expires at the end of 19 years. Um, he went on to say it would be enforced longer than that, it is an act of force and not of right. But then, the point is, by his math, the American Constitution expired over 200 years ago, and actually should have been rewritten 11 times by now. So quite frankly, I owe all of you an apology for just getting to it now. I should have done it 11 times by now. Um, I've been slacking, I'm a slacker, I've been busy. Forgive me for that. Um, I would also say that what's more, it would seem a little bit that our Constitution these days need, needs a little bit of good publicity. Certainly, we know that people quote it or try to. We know that people cite it or try to. We know that people put it on uh, protest posters, even though they sometimes, again, misquote it or get it wrong. They cozy up to it for all the good reasons that we revere it, but they sometimes don't know what's in it. Um, but that's also somewhat globally, too. The, the, the Constitution needs a little bit of, of uh, good publicity. 25 years ago, I'm going to throw a stat out at you. First row, I need your help on this one. Um, 25 years ago, of the 170 countries that then existed, a full 160 of them, which is to say 94%, based their constitution, and these are old countries, <laughs> based their constitutions, or the newest version of their constitutions, at least in part, on the American Constitution. Uh, in the last 25 years, when countries go around looking for a constitution on which to base their democracy, unfortunately, according to a study that was printed in the New York Times a couple months ago, exactly zero have reached out to us for uh, help. That is to say, we help them write their constitutions, but they don't base their constitution on the American Constitution. Add to that, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she was in Supreme Court Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she was in Egypt just a couple months ago, said that if she were designing a constitution in 2012, she would actually not look to the American Constitution as a model, which is kind of shocking, because it's Ruth Bader Ginsburg, it's kind of her job to protect every clause in the Constitution. Now granted, that doesn't mean she has to blindly cheerlead for it, like I have presumed I'm going to. Uh, for that matter, you know, she's obligated to, to protect it, uh, authorized to do so, but I thought I'll step up and cheerlead for it, even though I'm not authorized to do so. Um, as I've said, the only time I wear a robe is at this spot. All right. Uh, now, the question is, why do they not look to our, our Constitution anymore? They instead look to other Constitutions. Uh, the South Africa Constitution is one they look to. Um, it's certainly rather new. Uh, and the Canadian Constitution as, as well, which is especially galling. Um, right? uh, but apparently they look to those constitutions because in their estimation, those constitutions care more about human rights and something called the, I want to make sure I'm getting this right, environment. <laughs> environment, there it is. Um, 
So that's another reason I read wrote the Constitution. And finally, my last reason, which I think you can appreciate, is I just figured if Apple can rewrite their iTunes service agreement every 19 minutes, then sort of like <laughs> rewrite the Constitution every 19 years. The question then becomes, well, why, why rewrite it rather than just point at it and say, well, hey, it's good. What we have is pretty darn good. Let's all, let's all get behind it. Why do a comic takedown, a fraudulent Jeremiah of every article and amendment in the thing? Um, and actually, I begin the book with, I think, a, a, an anecdote from American history, the best kind of history, that <laughs> might actually indicate why I wrote this book in full. Yes, this is my bookmark, forgive me. Hold this up, a goose in Greece, true story. Um, <laughs> like, I heard that. I'll, just, I'll, take, I'll take the leg. Um, it goes like this. Are there any kids in the audience? There's a swear <laughs> Teenagers. Their beloved bell was in jeopardy. It had hung dutifully for decades, peeling hourly from its steeple above the Pennsylvania State House, breaking the peace of the Philadelphia streets only to remind its citizens that time had marched on and all was well. But these were no longer peaceful times. It was 1777, a year after America had declared her independence from the British crown, and only days after her lion-hearted general, George Washington, had suffered a withering defeat at the Battle of Brandywine. By the way, if John Oliver were here right now, I'm sure he would cheer at that sentence. Um, all signs were that Philadelphia, the revolutionary capital, might well be the next to fall. Fearing that the king's men would melt any metal they found into British cannons, a few American patriots confiscated their own bell, soon to be known appropriately as the Liberty Bell, and hid it in the safest place they could find, under a pile of horse manure. The gambit worked. The marauding redcoats never got their British hands on our American liberty. The lesson learned back then rings as clear today <laughs> you see it coming, don't you? Sometimes, in order to save and honor something we cherish, we have to shit on it. So hopefully that gives me the political cover to do this comic takedown. Uh, I will also say it was amusing to me to see, and you might have seen this too, I watched it on MSNBC only a couple weeks ago. There's a little slice of life piece. They did a piece about the fact that the maintenance men, uh, maintenance crew at, at Independence Hall, where the Liberty Bell is, actually spent a full day, I think a day and a half, adding a correct protective shellac to the outside of the Liberty Bell. And I just thought, knowing what we know now about where the Liberty Bell has been, it's about 240 years too late, nonetheless. Um, OK. So the founders, well, actually, I could take, I'll take a detour and, and, and uh, mention one other thing. Um, the last couple of weeks, people have also asked, as I've kind of been doing some readings and talking to people, well, where did you get the idea to rewrite the Constitution? Um, because after all, that's a pretty crazy thing to do. Um, well, in my research, last research, I learned that actually I wasn't the first person to do it, which was both a heartbreaking yet somewhat motivational revelation. Um, and in fact, there's a gentleman that I also start out with in the book a little bit that set the table for what I was about to do. He essentially wrote the serious version of what I think is my comedy book. Uh, but I think he's such a fascinating character that I'm happy to share him with you one quick thing. Uh, Forward, if not me, who? Pay attention, this is important. A man named Rexford Guy Tugwell, who actually existed, and whose cartoonish name, therefore, I did not make up, spent the last 30 years of his life trying to rewrite the Constitution of the United States. Before his death in 1979, he composed 32 separate drafts of a revised Constitution, a new and improved set of guiding principles he hoped would be appropriate to the modern times accepted by his government, and embraced by his nation. He failed. Although he completed his self-imposed fool's errand and published his draft with a reputable publisher who frankly should have known better, it rhymes with Marper's Hagazine, his proposals were far too nutballs for even the indulgent sensibilities of the 1970s. Replace the 50 states with 20 republics. Elect the president to one nine-year term. Add two branches of government. Eliminate the Senate. Rename the United States of America the New States of America. Yeah, I know, nutballs. The thing is, he had fooled many people, even presidents, for decades. Armed with a degree in agricultural economy from Wharton in the 1920s, Tugwell was a vocal part of Franklin D. Roosevelt's so-called brain trust and served as an architect of the New Deal in the 1930s. 
He was even featured on the cover of Time magazine in 1934, five years before Hitler was so honored. You know, back when it meant something. Then things got weird. Tugwell, a devotee of the literature of revolt and reconstruction, became the first and mercifully only head of FDR's notorious resettlement administration, a federal agency tasked with road relocating the urban poor to the suburbs. Tugwell took to the gig like a pig to mud. It wasn't long before he and the agency were attacked for being socialist and utopian, and just a little bit nutballs. Something about a crazy notion to, quote, relocate the urban poor to the suburbs. <laughs> There were other signs of his troubling lack of judgment. During a 1927 junket to the Soviet Union, Tugwell missed a six-hour meeting with Joseph Stalin because he lost track of time while, collecting, while touring a collective farm. To repeat, Tugwell was too busy studying communism to meet with Joseph Stalin. <laughs> then, apparently taking his desire to get off the fast track far too literally, he went to work for the American Molasses Company, whose name, it must be said, I also did not make up. One last hurrah on American politics beckoned, however, when New York Mayor Fiorella LaGuardia appointed Tugwell chairman of the New York City Planning Commission. Here, too, Tugwell ruffled feathers, insisting publicly that his commission was no less than, quote, the fourth power of government. <laughs> News to both Mayor LaGuardia and Park Commissioner Robert Moses. His options exhausted, Tugwell went south. In 1942, he became the governor of Puerto Rico, having received zero votes and having won no election. At the time, the Puerto Rican governorship was an appointed position, and FDR was seemingly more than happy to appoint him and appoint him as far away as possible. Some measure of his success there might be surmised by the fact that soon after he left office, the position became an elective one. The people of Puerto Rico insisted on their right to choose their leader. It was then, as the 1950s approached, that Tugwell began having bright ideas. The 20th century was already half over, and as the nation marched toward its 200th birthday, he began to feel that its creaky constitution was nothing to celebrate, that our basic laws, inadequate to our modern needs, needed total, quote-unquote, reassessment. So, much like Alexis de Tocqueville, but exactly the opposite, Tocqueville traveled throughout America to learn its virtues, Tugwell ditched America to catalog its faults, Tugwell began to write a series of articles, which turned into a small library of books, which turned into one heck of a delusion of grandeur. That he, the guy who missed the meeting with Stalin, who had spent years making a sweetener for baked beans, and who was best known as the former, go former governor of Spanish-speaking Puerto Rico, should rewrite the Constitution of the United States of America. A mere 30 years later, he had rewritten our preeminent founding document. No one noticed. At the time of his death, he was a little-known academic living in Santa Barbara, a footnote in some Puerto Rican history books. While I mock his failure, I admire his cojones. For Rexford Guy Tugwell, agricultural economist, pseudo-communist, actual person, nutball, may have been a misguided crank, everyone says so, yet he tried and failed to do what I had yet only failed to try. That ends now. So that's why I begin the book pointing out that I'm not the first. But here's the thing, Tugwell knew, as I have come to learn, as many of the founders actually suspected, that the Constitution the framers wrote in that hot Philadelphia summer was, as the kids might say, a bit of a hot mess. Uh, for starters, this venerated document, and again, we venerate it for all the right reasons, but nonetheless, this venerated document doesn't even mention slavery, or democracy, or even Facebook, <laughs> it plays favorites among the states, giving Wyoming as many senators as New York, and I mean, come on. <laughs> it has typos and misspellings and a smudge that, and this is true, may or may not be a comma empowering the government to steal your house, to seize your house, <laughs> depending on which constitutional scholar you ask, they are debating it. And it is scrawled with the quill of a goose on the skin of a goat, and its preamble, wait for it, its preamble, its most famous introductory passage, was written by Delegate Gouverneur Morris, a man with a peg leg. They called him the Peg Leg Morris, which, if you think about it, gives our sacred constitution barely a leg to stand on. Who's with me? Anyone? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, groan. Groan if you must. And you probably should. Yes, I've won an Emmy for that kind of workplay. <laughs> by the way, I do have, just to point out how the rest of the night should go, I want to point out that uh, Article 4, which uh, I rewrote, Article 4, which is supposed to referee among the states, but doesn't do such a great job of it, so I decided to, in fact, solve this. Let's just rank the states already. Uh, of course I have New York number one. But I'm just saying, depending on how you treat me for the rest of the night with those groans.
and I might, it might drop down a piece of pot. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Just saying, be nice to me. Okay. I can take it. Um, so where was I? I oh yes, uh, George Washington himself. I spoke of the founders not being sure of their handiwork. George Washington himself wished that the Constitution they had written in Philadelphia, quote, had been made more perfect. Uh, and in fact, for Benjamin Franklin said he could stomach it only, quote, with all its faults. And in fact, on the very last day of the Constitutional Convention, I think this is kind of hilarious, on the very last day of the Constitutional Convention, Benjamin Franklin, knowing that it was a, it was a mixed message whether or not they were actually going to get this thing ratified, even among the delegates in the room, let alone the states, he actually stood up and said, among other things, he wanted the, everyone in the room to doubt their own infallibility and put their name to the measure. In other words, they all thought that they could have done better, but nonetheless, let's for a moment as a community doubt our infallibility and, and sign the thing. But he also said something very specific that I get a kick out of every time I read it um, that kind of, I think, indicates truly what he might have thought if you read between the lines about the Constitution. And this is what he said in that last day speech. He said, I confess that there are several parts of this Constitution which I do not at present approve. But I am not sure I shall never approve them. Thus I consent to this Constitution because I expect no better, and because I am not sure that it is not the best. <laughs> which to some sounds like a Republican endorsing Mitt Romney. People <laughs> damning with faint praise, I suppose. Uh, because, my fellow Americans here at the Strand, while we think of our Constitution, and we are right to think so, as the painstakingly designed blueprint brought up by, in Thomas Jefferson's words, an assembly of demigods who laid the foundation for the sturdiest republic ever created, it is that, but it is also this. By the end of the summer, the framers in Philadelphia knew the other truth, that the Constitution wasn't just a blueprint. It was also a bit of a, and I used this phrase a year ago, an etch-a-sketch. Uh, a haphazard series of blunders. I'm hearing hisses on the side of the room. I could take it. Uh, shaken clean and redrawn dozens of times during a sweltering summer of petty debates, drunken ramblings, wild improvisation, and desperate compromise. I would say you have to imagine it. Thank you. Uh, you have to imagine what they're going through. They were, this was, I mean, you know how hot it is today. You know how hot it's been in the last couple of weeks. It's even hotter in Philadelphia. And they had four months of this. Four months of a sweltering summer in Philadelphia. Uh, they were wearing powdered wigs, you might remember. They were wearing wool coats. They locked the doors, shuttered the windows for privacy. There was no such thing as air conditioning. That wasn't invented until a century later. Um, add to that, the so the pungent is my point. Uh, add to that the distractions across the street. There was a prison riot across the street. Um, they were, butchers were throwing animal carcasses into the gutters just outside, so even more pungent. Not exactly the best scenario for rational thinking. Add to that, that they were all drinking beer for breakfast. True story. Now, granted, most colonists at the time drank beer and drank it for breakfast. It was safer than water. But I think the fact remains, they were drinking beer for breakfast. And in fact, some of them drank so much, they drank so much alcohol, the whole crowd. But some of them drank so much that they, Luther Martin, for example, twice got up and gave a six-hour rambling speech that I'm sure he thought was very charming. <laughs> uh, but that nonetheless derailed the Constitution for a day or two. They, you know, they gabbled at the close saying, we don't know what to do with what he just said. Let's, let's read what he just said. You know, so true. I mean, it was just, and this is, and they had to design an entire country in four months. They wanted to do it in three days. They, you know, by the end of the summer, they were sick of each other. They just wanted to get rid of it. But anyway, well, it's the great compromise. That's my point. Um, so, yes, uh, I will also say this. They adopted two procedural measures that I'm sure they thought were a good idea at the time. Uh, the first being that they called for a motion, quote, to call for the yeas and nays and have them entered in the minutes. Oh, excuse me, they were voted down a notion to call for the yeas and nays and have them entered in the minutes. In other words, to know what the hell was going on at any time. Uh, and then they also adopted something called the Committee of the Whole, which meant that even after they had decided things, any one of the delegates could say, you know what, I want to revisit what we talked about a month ago, and they would have to revisit it. They could vote on anything, but none of, this, none of the votes actually stuck. Um, so the truth of the matter is that they actually started, they then, at the very end of the summer, um, appointed something called a Committee of Style, because they were so sick of each other that they wanted to be done, and they hadn't really decided anything, that the smaller Committee of Style was assigned to start writing up the Constitution at night, more or less, and, and show it to them in the morning if there's something that they could vote on and they might vote for it. That's, well, that's kind of what happened. Now, you don't have to imagine you know, the devolution uh, entirely of the Constitution, because I do, do, uh, I do take a lot of time to explain what happened there. Um, but I will say uh, it kind of wrapped up like this. 
Now we understand how it all happened, or rather, almost didn't. The Constitution wasn't exactly a miracle of Philadelphia written by an assembly of demigods. It was that, but it was also the contrary. What began as a measured, deliberate effort to rescue a beleaguered country became a perpetual, unresolved motion machine, a maddening cycle of non-binding votes by a parade of toothless committees marked by fits and starts, fights and, quote, full stops, unquote, conducted by a combative group of exhausted, drunken, broke, petty, partisan, scheming, squabbling, bloviating, backstabbing, grandstanding, godforsaken, posturing, <laughs> restless, cow-tipping, I explained that earlier, homesick, cloistered, claustrophobic, sensory-deprived, under-oxygenated, fed up, talked out, overheated delegates, so distraught and despairing, they threatened violence, true, secession, also true, foreign allegiance, true, and even prayer, said Benjamin Franklin, and concluded for those who didn't abandon the proceedings altogether, also true, with as much premeditation and forethought as a game of musical chairs. The last, least abhorrent, mutually somewhat acceptable idea on the table when the music stopped, or the heat became too unbearable, or the liquor too strong, or the rioting too loud, or the pressure too intense, or the company too loathsome, or the wigs too uncomfortable, or the patience too thin, became the law of the land. <laughs> As much the product of, yes, an assembly of demigods, as some might say, a confederacy of somewhat dunces. From page one, the Constitution is, by its own admission, a great compromise. It is also what you get when you drink beer for breakfast. They drank, again, so much beer that I, I, I feel compelled to point this out as well. When they finally decided, all right, this is our Constitution, but they hadn't yet signed it, um, well, they threw a party. Why they threw a party, you could say either to congratulate themselves or in advance of what they knew they were about to do. Um, but here's uh, what happened at that party. They were about to add their signatures to an extremely anticipated official document they had extremely mixed feelings about. They drank themselves, oh sorry, so the delegates did what anyone, anyone might do under such pressure. They drank themselves silly. After they toasted the occasion, they drowned their miseries. They had spent four months compromising many of their values, as they said. Perhaps they could drink their guilt away. They certainly tried. In the span of just a few hours, the 55 men who crowded City Tavern on Friday, September 14, 1787, guzzled enough alcohol to fell an army regiment. 60 bottles of claret, 54 bottles of Madeira, 50 bottles of old stock, vats of porter, cider, and beer, and what has been described as some bowls of rum. <laughs> they weren't just pledging their sacred honor, they were pledging a frat. So wild did the celebration get that City Tavern, a place quite familiar with drunkenness, took the unusual step of sending along a bill for, quote, breakage, unquote. <laughs> uh, they drank a lot, which actually brings me, with it, by a terrible transition, to my drinking companion. Uh, um, one of the unfortunate, I guess, excuse me, fortunate accidents, that was a boring, boring slip. One of the fortunate accidents of, of working on this book was uh, getting to have lunch with Justice Scalia. Um, uh, and I will tell you, I mean, I wanted to meet with Justice Scalia because, you know, I thought who on the face of the planet, let alone in the country, would really be most amenable to a page one wholesale rewrite of the Constitution? <laughs> and I thought definitely be the man who spent his entire career protecting every phrase, clause, sentence, piece of punctuation in the darn thing. Um, because, you know, after all, he's a man who does not suffer fools, um, but, and what am I but fool? So, I also think it's interesting, by the way, that he too uh, believes, as Thomas Jefferson does, that the Constitution is, and these are, this is his words, dead. Um, as Thomas Jefferson said as well, expired. Um, the only difference is that he, as to say Scalia, means dead as a compliment, I guess. <laughs> Which I'm not quite sure. He means quit trying to ride by, but he means enjoy it for what it, for its better days. You know, like Frank Sinatra, or Greece. Um, so yeah, to my surprise, he agreed to meet. Uh, we met at the National Gallery, um, and we talked of many things constitutional. By the way, I'm getting three text messages in my pants, so I think it might be John Oliver. <laughs> Fingers crossed, they're still doing something. But that's all right. You're having a good time, right, people? <laughs> okay. But nonetheless, I'll, I'll adopt an English accent for the Q&A. How's that? So when you ask me questions. Um, so we talked of many things constitutional when, when I met with Justice Scalia. And uh, 
And I, but I knew at some point that I would have to turn our attentions to his bread and butter, to his gainful employment, to the third article of the Constitution, which of course is the judicial branch, what he does for a living. Um, now, hopefully in the book what I've done is that for 80% of the chapters, or I should say 80% of each chapter, I actually address what people these days think are the real issues, either positive or negative, about the Constitution. Things that they either think are virtues or vices, changes they would want to make or make sure not to be changed. Uh, and granted, the, my solutions to those problems are a little bit absurd. That's where the comedy comes in. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I try to address the real issues in the chart. In the third article, that is to say the judicial branch, which I was sitting down to discuss with Scalia, one thing that people often suggest is whether or not it's appropriate that judges have lifetime tenure. Now, as soon as I said, let's talk about the third article, and Your Honor, if you don't mind, uh, what do you think about lifetime tenure? And as soon as I said tenure, he picked up a fork, <laughs> poked it at me, and said, don't you dare, don't you dare change lifetime tenure, and then with a grin added, and if you do, at least grandfather me in, because I like my job, and I don't want you to change that. Um, because the truth of the matter is that the Constitution says nothing about lifetime tenure. It merely says that judges, as suggested by the third article that determines our court system, judges shall serve, should serve their offices during good behavior. That's all it says. Um, now, we have interpreted that from the very beginning as lifetime tenure for a bunch of very good reasons, um, most prominent being that they were reacting to the fact that English kings would almost willy-nilly take judges off the bench for whatever reason the kings or their magistrates thought were important. Um, so we thought, let's go the other way with this. After all, that was the point of independence to some degree. Um, so, when, so, so it doesn't actually say that. Now, I've suggested to the justice, all right, in 2012, is that still appropriate? Um, and this is actually what happened then. Um, again, while my knees were trembling, I still managed to have, have this conversation. <coughs> So again, it says well, good behavior, not lifetime behavior. I don't bother lecturing Justice Scalia on any of this. After decades of legal study and 25 years of service as one of America's top judges, he's been fully briefed. Instead, I begin my cross-examination. How about you, I ask. How about me what, he counters. Can you imagine just walking away, I ask. Of course I can, he scoffs with a couldn't care less tone that implies he'd just as soon leave today if only he hadn't signed a two-year lease on his Supreme Court locker. When, I ask. Uh, yeah, I know, right? Yeah. He says, like I've said before, as soon as I'm not firing on all eight cylinders, when I'm, when I'm not doing the job as well as I used to, it'll be time to go. How will you know that when that is? <laughs> he looks me straight in the eye. Oh, so you don't need some outside authority limiting the term of your service. I'm fairly aware of the requirements of the position. He says, I'll know when I can no longer fulfill them. And yet, what if I told you, Your Honor, that someone says you're wrong about that? Someone even more powerful than you. And who is that? Someone you know quite well. He looks at me, wondering if he should ask. Who? If this were a case in some courtroom drama, this is the moment when I would stand slowly, scan the jury, look back at the judge, and call on my surprise witness. May it please the court, I now call to the stand, dramatic pause, the current Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. If this were indeed a courtroom drama, the double doors in the back of the courtroom would fly open, the stenographer would record the reaction of the gallery, audible gasps, and Chief Justice John G. Roberts, Jr. would saunter up the aisle hesitating only long enough to lock eyes with fellow Justice Scalia and feel his glare. Et tu, Roberte. <laughs> Roberts would then explain to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that no matter what he says or how he pleads for mercy, Justice Hanson and Scalia should have been kicked off the court exactly 10 years ago. Back in real life, I explain what the hell I'm talking about. When he was a lawyer in the Reagan White House, 22 years after he joined the Supremes, John Roberts argued on behalf of a 15-year term limit for Supreme Court justices. It was both a pragmatic proposal, as he saw it, the founders, quote, adopted life tenure at a time when, simply, when people simply did not live as long as they do now, unquote, and a principled one, for many of the same reasons I've trotted out here at this lunch. 
quote, a judge insulated from the normal currents of life for 25 or 30 years was a rarity back then, but is becoming commonplace today, he wrote in a White House memo. Setting a term of, say, 15 years would ensure that federal judges would not lose all touch with, quote, reality through <laughs> decades of ivory, to ivory tower existence, unquote. It is an indictment of lifetime tenure too compelling to ignore. As I finish explaining, one thing is clear. Scalia knew nothing of this. <laughs> is that so, he asks? Roberts thought that? I have outlawed the longest serving associate justice of the Supreme Court. <laughs> really? He thought that? He asks again. Yes, I say, pausing a beat for dramatic effect. Yes, he did. For a moment, Scalia seemed speechless. He could muster no defense. Even though, we're sitting, even though we're sitting in the National Gallery, not the Supreme Court, and eating lunch, not arguing case law, I am tempted to shout, the prosecution rests, <laughs> slam an imaginary briefcase, and march out triumphantly. But I don't. I stay. And Scalia's grin returns. <laughs> well, he says, I doubt he does any more. <laughs> Scalia has a good point. Roberts doesn't think that anymore. When Roberts himself was asked about his previous comments at his confirmation hearings in 2005, he flip-flopped. Predictably, his perspective on the issue had evolved. As the law professor Larry Sabato has eloquently put it, on the issue of lifetime tenure, where one stands depends on where one sits. <laughs> Scalia's joke, nonetheless, seems to put him back on offense. So, he asks, so, it is an argument that had stymied me before. So what? So, are you going to make me retire with your new constitution? I mean, I've been here longer than 15 years. Oh, he's not on the attack. He's throwing himself on the mercy of my court. No, sir, I, I'm not here to fire Justice Scalia, though I appreciate his acknowledgement of my authority to do so. <laughs> so, he says, what exactly do you propose? I thought he'd never ask. Simple, I say. Your new Article 3. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court, and the judges shall hold their offices during good behavior. Scalia seems confused. But that's what Article 3 already says. Not exactly, I clarify. I drop the U from behavior to make it more American. <laughs> but otherwise, that's Article 3. Indeed it is, Your Honor. Indeed it is. It was, I was certain, a remedy for Article 3 that an originalist like Justice Scalia could not help but support. We take it literally. We revive the original article and we honor its original language. Judges shall hold their offices during good behavior. Surely a died in the parchment originalist wouldn't mind a stricter adherence to the text of the original version article, the genuine article, before it was corrupted over decades of convenient interpretations by self-serving and self Excuse me, by self-serving and self-preserving justices of all political stripes who, and this is true, stayed too long in the court merely to spite a president or will away a stroke or stave off a retirement of pinochle and shuffleboard, not exactly quote-unquote good behavior. The founders never declared explicitly that good behavior necessarily meant for life. So why on this occasion only would an originalist throw his lot in with uh, living constitutionalists <laughs> eager to bend the constitution to their will? I had him dead to rights. Surely he, a man who swore by the letter of the law, would swear by the letter of this law, that is, save one letter, to which he owed his entire career. I was proud of my judicial jujitsu. Thank you. <laughs> but who determines good behavior, he asks. Good behavior, I correct him. He was pronouncing the U. That's what I said. Who gets to decide? Well, I've anticipated this question. Scalia listens closely as a proposed judging body composed of three people, appointed by the president, whose sole responsibility is to determine whether the justices are passing the good behavior test, as revived by my new constitution. He gets what I'm aiming at. A supreme supreme court, he says with a laugh. Scalia is evidently amused by the idea. I can tell he's not ruling it out. Just one question, he says. I raise my chin and allow it. Yes, Your Honor. How long do they serve? I hadn't thought of that. As you can probably tell, Justice Scalia is not a very smart man, obviously, 
but also a very funny guy. I mean, I tried to, if I tried to be funny, he was funny to me. If I tried to outlaw him, even though I claimed to have outlawed him, he came up back on top of me, of course. Um, he's a, he's, he knows what he's talking about, is the point. Um, but when I say he's funny, I mean he's officially funny. I mean he's officially the funniest Supreme Court justice on the bench. Now, how can I say such a thing? Because I got more stats for you. Um, a few years ago, I heard, well, like seven, seven, six or seven, seven years ago, that's what it was, um, the New York Times reported a study, St. Louis Law Review, um, someone there, they just released a, a batch of Supreme Court transcripts. And someone thought to count the number of times laughter, in brackets, was annotated after uh, Supreme Court justice had spoken. Uh, and by far, Scalia engendered the most laughter in the chamber. Um, you'll be happy to know he's twice as funny as Justice Breyer. <laughs> 19 times funnier than Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, and as I've often said, we don't know about Clarence Thomas. Um, because what you might know about Clarence Thomas is that he does not speak in the chamber. So it's actually possible that mathematically speaking, he is infinitely funny. It's possible that every time he speaks, he gets a laugh. He could be the Patch Adams of the Supreme Court. We don't know. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm not sure if Charles can make it, but I'll just say this. Now that I've justified this book's existence to you here at the Strand, to the ghosts of Madison and Hamilton, um, and to Justice Scalia, I'll conclude with these few thoughts before I will take, happily, what I hope will be some of your softball questions. Um, you're probably asking yourself, okay, Kevin, but does the world really need yet another book by, about a guy who rewrites the Constitution of the United States single-handedly? Yet another book, really? I mean, really, that's kind of a, a trope, isn't it? No, I would say to you, yes, it does. Um, because, ladies and gentlemen, the Constitution of the United States is hot. It is like Hunger Games hot. It's Fifty Shades of Grey hot. Um, people are constantly quoting it, even though they don't know what it says. Uh, politicians are hiding behind it, even though they're not quite sure what's in it. Uh, and as a piece of literature, the only thing that would make the Constitution hotter was if James Madison were a vampire. I promise you. It is so popular that right now, yes, somewhere in America, a thousand tea partiers are misquoting it. It's so amazing that somewhere Kanye West is, in, is accepting, oh, I screwed it up, is interrupting an acceptance speech to insist that it should have won. All right, wait for me, I'll get there. It's so exciting that somewhere Anthony Weiner is tweeting pics of himself having just seen it. Oh, yes. Which is why, on behalf of America, I have paid every price, bore every burden, and saved every receipt in my quest to assure its survival. But why now? That's the question. Well, I'll tell you this. At a time when Michelle Bachman believes that the battles of Lexington and Concord were fought in New Hampshire, at a time when Sarah Palin believes Paul Revere made his midnight ride to warn the British that we were armed, and at a time when, as you've heard, as a, as you've heard John Boehner believes we hold these truths to be self-evident in his favorite part of the Constitution when it's in the Declaration of Independence, and we don't know that, in fact, J James Madison wasn't a vampire, I suppose it shouldn't be too hard to believe this, that I, Kevin Blyer, despite having no qualifications, am the most qualified man to rewrite the Constitution of the United States. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. If you do, I hope you'll help me ratify it. Sure, why not? Uh, and uh, anyway, thank you very much. I'm happy to take a few questions. I don't think you My mom likes to remind me. My, parent, my father was in the, the health services. Uh, when I was two, I demanded that we move to the west. So I moved to Seattle and grew up there in Seattle. Um, I'm curious, why do you ask? Is it my accent? Um, <laughs> it wasn't my dad, it was just like, um, I mean, uh, like, where from. Fair enough. Yeah. I would like to say I was born and raised, and raised in Philadelphia. That would be a lie. Yeah. Please, in the back. All right, I got two questions. One, All right. Did Justice Scalia eat broccoli when you died? Ah, uh, uh, it's funny. It's for some reason I do get the question a lot. What did you guys eat? Which I'll take. You know, uh, he had a salad. How do you pronounce it? Salad de squaws. As part of a, it was like the National Gallery has basically a high-end buffet where you can go and get whatever you want. And I will tell you, I'm sure I trailed him. This is before we actually started to talk. We're in line. I'm thinking I'm about to have a conversation with Justice Scalia, in which I tell him that I rewrote the Constitution of the United States. I mean, I think he knew. That's why he agreed. I know he knew, but he agreed, and I just didn't know it was coming back my way. So the point is, I was a little nervous about it. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, I, sure, I'll lie to you. I wasn't nervous about it. <laughs> no, I was nervous about it, and I remember piling food onto my 
plate and putting it down and maybe even eating something. I don't remember a single thing about it though, just because you know I was more interested in making sure that I'm holding up my end of the bargain on the conversation. I will say just generally, I mean, what really it fueled my sales because I knew that I was doing something I guess provocative in rewriting the Constitution. But when I knew that Justice Scalia himself, for lack of a better word, got it, you know, understood the joke, uh, understood what the game was, because he knew that ultimately my whole point, and I could read actually, I might read one last section. But my whole point was to bring people back to the Constitution so that they also go back to the source code and at least know what they're talking about when they try to quote it um, and say, well, the Constitution says. They're saying that because they might have even read it or at least read my book, which is one step closer to that, uh, rather than saying the Constitution says because they heard on either MSNBC or Fox News that someone said the Constitution says. Because uh, I think that's probably a better way to go. Now, you don't have to do what I did, which is go to the National Archives and not only read the Constitution, but read the Constitution. I stood there for 45 minutes while I'm elbowing six-year-olds out of the way. They don't want you to do that, by the way. They want you to move past, look at it, move past. I kept going back, so I'm gonna read the Constitution. I figured, because everyone could say they've read the Constitution, no one can say they've read the Constitution. I haven't, like the guy who wrote it, basically. Um, digression, I would say. But nonetheless, yeah, when I knew that he was willing to get behind the project, um, uh, I, it was very helpful to finish, finish it up, so to speak. You had a second question. That was a better answer to a flipping question than I expected. But uh, oh, you asked what did question. I eat? You're right, no, I took that no, random and did not. Yeah. But anyway, um, my real question was, which is your least favorite amendment? Least favorite amendment? First time I've been asked that. First time, well, okay. <laughs> it's going to be pretty easy, actually. I've never been asked that before, but I have a pretty easy answer. Uh, I like whiskey. So <laughs> you're going to not be surprised that it was the, the, the amendment suggests a prohibition, but I'm also happy that it's been repealed in the 21st. Uh, so yeah, that's my least favorite amendment, but it turns out it's a lot of people's least favorite amendments. So, yeah, it turns out that in fact, the country kind of stepped up and said, we made a huge mistake at that moment. Um, so yeah, that's certainly my least favorite amendment. And I do rewrite it a bit too, but I, you can see which side I come out of. I'm Irish after all. I showed up here drunk. <laughs> I did not. True. Please. Given the uh, circumstances under which it was written, uh, what do you think drives the fact that as a younger country generally, we have one of the oldest constitutions? And as my flippant question, do you think the last time that Clarence Thomas spoke on the bench in 2006, did he go out on a laugh and just wanted to... You know, <laughs> <laughs> I should look to see if that was the last one. Yeah, exactly. Leave one more. Like a stanza. Yeah. Right? Just pull into stanza. I'm done. I'm out. Leave. Um, so I don't know the answer to the second part, although I'm curious to know it myself. Maybe I'll go find out later. Um, first part of why do we have a long standing constitution? Um, look, because there's a lot of virtues in the constitution, I think. And again, I think I will read that last section to kind of imply where I come out on this. A lot of virtues in the constitution. Add to that, the truth of the matter, it's incredibly hard to amend our constitution let alone try to scrap it and have an entire constitutional convention to start from scratch again. That just isn't going to happen. Um, even James Madison himself, who is known as the father of the Constitution, as you know. By the way, I, I feel that he's a kindred spirit, not only because he wrote, we, we both have, re have written constitutions now, but because, I don't point out, he's, like, he's a small man as well. As I've said before, I see only as far as I do because I stand on the shoulders of a short man. Um, between the two of us, a trench coat, true. Uh, uh, but it's very hard. So even James Madison, who you would think would have a pride of authorship on this, in his later years, was was heard to say that he was shocked that so few amendments had actually been ratified. Um, it's just hard to ratify or to uh, to amend, even though it's supposed to be something that can be redesigned by every generation, according to Thomas Jefferson and others as well. Um, and I don't think it's going to get any easier either. So it is. We are going to live with it. Um, but at a time when we can't get, when we have to get 60 votes to get anything done in Congress, um, add to that the idea of having both state legislators, you know, three quarters of two thirds of state legislators, one three, two, three, three quarters of, of voters, etc. Um, I, I flipped that, excuse me. But nonetheless, very hard to, to amend the Constitution, um, and I don't expect that in our lifetimes we might actually see any other amendment other than the ones constitutional scholars say tinker at the margins, which is things like moving dates of inaugurations. Even though I think that was a big one. Um, other, other ones about congressional pay and what have you, other ones that we can get behind. But even a balanced budget amendment is going to be hard to get done. It might get done, um, but I kind of, my, my bets are against it. I'm happy to come back and eat pro if something happens in the next 10 years. Please. Um, I read your mention the first stroke 
I could hear you, sir. Stroke, bear with me. Yeah. Um, I, I read the um, Amelie, Amelie Slay's book, The Young. Um, Amelie Slay's, uh, yeah. yeah. The I Forgotten read about, Man, that one? Yeah. The, yeah, I haven't read it for you, so. I read the first half. Okay. And there, there was a journey in, um, um, I, I think I had tell well. Yeah. I did not know what you said. I remember. Yeah. I mean, he's a colorful character. Obviously, I made comic hay out of him. But I mean, ultimately, I'm, I meant it when I say that I kind of have to admire the guy for doing something, trying to do something so bold. So hopefully, what? my fraudulent Jeremiah about how dare he is, is something people can understand with the tongue in cheek kids. Right, but he was very instrumental in the music of the administration. That's right. So my question is with 1927, he did not leave Stalin, but with us, there was a junk in yep. Our ship went to uh, Russia. In 1927. I think that could be. I mean, he spent a lot of time in New York, so he might have taught there as well. Um, I don't know. We might have only got toward one day. My yeah. question is, um, this is not related to the book, but what is Hungary? I'm going to take a question related to the book. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> why is Hungary to his, uh, twice inflation, in, uh, tuition twice inflation, if the pair paid off the mortgage 200 years ago? That is a fair question, and I would argue if anyone here knows the answer to that, you want to <laughs> take a for a second. I have to punt. I have to admit my ignorance about that. I don't know. Do you have an answer? No, it's a yeah. it, it ripoff. It's a scam. Fair it's, enough. It's a ripoff. Same way. And Do you hear that, that Columbia? Do <laughs> yeah, yeah. um, you know, um, oh, Beverly? I don't. The uh, economist 100 years ago, Beverly. I'll look up Beverly. Conspicuous consumption. All right. Got it. So, yeah. All right, shall do. I, uh, I buy because of the expense. I would have brought you up with you. Sounds you got ripped off. I w I'm <laughs> against getting ripped off. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, do you have a question in the back? Yeah, tell us a little bit about the uh, all those fantastic portraits on the oh. side jacket of that really uh, dashing but old well, guy. I promise I did not plant this question, but he's absolutely right. <laughs> they are dashing, aren't they? Oh, yes. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> Such a narcissistic thing to do. Let me tell you. Um, a stunt, sure, why not? But they're all now in my apartment. Um, but what's hilarious, and this is, I think, a, kind of a, I decided that in order to commemorate the writing of the Constitution, I did what I presumed James Madison would have done, which is to sit for a portrait of myself. <laughs> so I wanted to actually write about what it felt like to be pondering and contemplating big, important constitutional issues while a noted portrait artist paints, paints me. Um, so yes, those portraits that you see there, and actually the one on the front, are real. Uh, uh, oil on campus, most of them, some of them are digital, you see. But none of them are just Photoshop, none of them are like slapdash. They're actually, people worked hard, hard on them. But what's funny to me is that while that was intended to be just kind of a little colorful thing to put or put in, you know, the end papers or perhaps chapter headings, it is because I sought a portrait that is the reason I found myself sitting across from Justice Scalia. Uh, I won't spoil it, well, I'll spoil it a little bit, but it's only a small thing. Um, one of the portrait artists I reached out to is this genius guy named Nelson Shanks, who's I didn't. I wasn't familiar because I, I just wasn't traveling in the portrait artist community. But nonetheless, <laughs> uh, he is one of the more renowned portrait artists. And I reached out to him and I said, "Here's my project. What do you think about it?" Um, he said, "Come by. We'll talk about it. Maybe we'll do a portrait." Now, granted, I showed up at his place at 6 p.m. on a Tuesday. Was there until 1 a.m. We, it was. We didn't talk a thing about. It. We never talked about the book or any of my projects. We drank, drank vodka. You know, all his friends came over. The sopranos singing arias. I mean, he's running this salon. And it was just a crazy experience. But he kicked everybody out at 1, 1 a.m. Thought that was a great night. But I'm no further to closer to getting a portrait. That happened four Tuesdays in a row. We never talked about it. And then the very last night, as I'm thinking, I can't waste, keep wasting loving this time, but I can't keep wasting this time because I have to, you know, spend these Tuesdays writing. I'm on the nights and weekends plan, the cell phone plan. To, get this book done because I have a full-time job. Uh, he finally said, you know, quarter one, what are we doing again? What is this? I said, I was hoping you'd do a portrait of me if you were inclined. He said, yeah, sounds good, sounds good. Because I think you're, it's a fun idea. Let's do this portrait. And then a couple days later, he calls me and says, what are you doing tomorrow? Well, actually, it was a couple weeks later. He says, what are you doing tomorrow? I said, I don't know. It's because um, 
Remember I told you you should have Justice Scalia write your preface? No, he told me that. I thought, you're, that's, what do you, there's no way in heck. Well, well, come, come down to DC. You're gonna have lunch with Justice Scalia tomorrow. <laughs> and he set it up. I thought, well, how did he do? He did it. Scalia's official portrait, and I didn't know this. So it was because of Scalia, because of Delta Shanks and his largesse and his good graces and um, his dead forever, that uh, I managed to find my way into have lunch with Scalia. And even since then, I've seen Justice Scalia twice. I even when I finished the book, and he knew what the book was. I was at a fundraiser with him at a table, and he raised a glass and said, Kevin, you're finished with your book, aren't you? And I said, I'm pretty close. He said, all right, to Kevin's finished book at this fundraiser, just as clear. Like, yeah, but I write about you, and you don't know what I write about yet. <laughs> but, uh, well, yeah, and here's the thing. He's on record as not being a fan of The Daily Show. He, he, Brian Lamb did an interview with him on Book Notes, and Brian, I think it was Brian Lamb, um, and he asked, have you seen The Daily Show? And he said explicitly, yeah, don't care for it. Next question. Really upset, I mean, obviously upset with us. But I don't know, I mean, maybe he's got, he's got a sense of humor, but maybe he's mellow, I don't know. I'm, 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 that's, yeah, that's, that's probably one of the reasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah but those are the naked pictures that kept it from being sold at Target and Walmart, as I recall. Please, yes. you to hear that I, I'm a pretty big fan of the First Amendment, <laughs> considering what I do for a living and have done for 15 plus years. Um, uh, as far as my changes to the, the, uh, to the articles and uh, amendments, I mean, I make some pretty bold changes to both Congress and to the executive branch um, that <coughs> probably are too lengthy to explain here, but um, it amuses me that I made some, like, for example, I made a change to the executive branch that uh, only reluctant saviors, that is to say, no one who actually declares that they're running for the president should be allowed to run for the president. <laughs> um, uh, because after all, you know, that's what we want. We want John, George Washington, it's not John Adams. Um, and so I make some pretty bold changes to the eligibility requirements for the presidency. And, and I, they're absurd, of course they are. I try to address the real issues, but they're absurd. And then I see, a couple weeks ago, Mitt Romney did something that I thought was genius. He, he was in Vegas with Trump. And he stood up at the podium and said, uh, um, you know, a businessman just came up to me and, and said, you know, we should change the eligibility requirements for the presidency. Because <laughs> um, we know we have age requirements and citizen and nation birth requirements. Um, but, you know, wouldn't it be a good idea, this is Romney saying, wouldn't it be a good idea to add a provision to the uh, Constitution, which I think he means an amendment, because we can add provisions to um, uh, that anyone who runs for the presidency should be required to have three years business experience. Now, first of all, that would disqualify Roosevelt and Eisenhower McCain. Um, but beyond that, I did, however, I thought that was genius because what Mitt, is Mitt Romney saying? And he's, and he, it's such a bold move on his part because what he's doing is he's reducing the number of people eligible to be president until it starts to only describe him. <laughs> you know? So that, I thought, if he's, it felt like he could have sold, sold that for my book. Of course, he also said, you might have seen, that he would, um, he would, for, he might forego a salary if he which there's some preface, uh, predicate to this. I think he did that in, 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 in Massachusetts, and also on the Olympics he took no salary, because kind of, kind of doesn't need one. But I did think that was kind of amusing to have a president that works on commission, which is <laughs> you know, an idea for example. So I made similarly bold changes to the executive branch, but as I uh, you know, read my own book, or for that matter, read the book, or go on tour with the book, or what have you, it is amusing to see that they're not maybe as absurd as even, even the people running for president have suggested. <laughs> Um, and then I'd make other kind of, I think, kept I kept the Senate, but there's a paperback version. Don't worry, okay. I might, I might change it. I might change it. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Any other questions, please? Yes. The comma. Yeah. There's a smudge. Yeah. I could show it to you if I could find it. Although I'm not sure how quickly I can get there. It's a smudge. That's it. That's near the near at least the eminent domain clause. Um, and it might change uh, exactly how, to, how it should be interpreted. Now, punctuation actually throughout the book is kind of an amazing thing because punctuation is why, in part, the, um, the, uh, the, the Second Amendment is so hard to understand because the grammar is a little bit odd. And in fact, in, I rewrote the Second Amendment 
but so has Scalia. Um, in his decision on, on the recent decision, he actually rewrote it, saying it should really be written like this, which I thought was a pretty profound thing to do. Other people have rewritten the Second Amendment to change the punctuation as well. Um, Michael Haller, who's an NRA gun instructor, who wrote something called The Constitution Made Easy, which ha happens to be uh, one of the endorsed constitutions for the Tea Party. Yes, the Constitution Made Easy, oddly enough. Um, but he rewrote it as well, and it's very similar to Scalia. And so I actually say, okay, that's my solution in the Second Amendment is to, if it's punctuation is a problem, if I can add punctuation to make it such that, you know, uh, crazy people don't get guns, even though I'm a fan of the First Second Amendment, I think that individuals do have a right to bear arms, I thought I need to at least do something so that people who shouldn't have guns and do crazy things with them don't get them. So I'll just add as much punctuation as possible. Uh, so you'll see that it'll, it's wide open for interpretation so that anyone after the fact can actually go into it and say, I see here this particular interpretation. Uh, it's just a you know a tongue in cheek way to say please let's get a little more sensible on this. Um, but yes, uh, in the in the if you'll see it and, uh, is there. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. I actually have a magnified shot so you can see it closer and closer. Uh, it's, any other questions? I have to take one more question or two more short ones. Yes, please. Uh, would you, as a writer, rather have your reader? Uh, read through the book, take it very seriously, learn something, but not laugh at all. Oh boy. Or rather have the reader like really laugh and enjoy every second of it, but come out with them with like no, like, no, nothing new. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to choose? I mean, look, I, I'm just eager to please. I want you to laugh, of course. I mean, I, 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 I hopefully it's an amusing read, and if you learn something along the way, uh, how dare you? Uh, but also, yeah, I'm happy. I, yeah, if I had to, if I had to figure to force my hand, I want people to enjoy the read. So, uh, sure. uh, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, go get it.